Wow, it is so great to be here. What an amazing morning. Um, I am full of new ideas and new thoughts. And seeing this theme of flow coming through each talk is fascinating. I'm going to talk about flow as well. And the title of my, um, my talk today has two meanings. One is ultra fast impacts in biology in the technical sense. So a lot of the research in my lab focuses on extremely fast movements in biology, things like ants that jump with their jaws and smashing things, but also about this other issue of what is a person's impact in science. And these are the two stories that I'll talk about today. And I wanted to start actually in college. And I had no idea what I was going to do in science, but I knew I wanted to be a scientist. No one around me told me to how, to how to be a scientist. It's not part of my family history. But I, I, I knew there was something really, really amazing about biology. So I found this lab, Professor Carl Leem's lab. And I was working in there on things like fish swimming and lobsters making sound in the water. And I was working in there for a long time. And I noticed that he had this framed, hand-drawn award on the wall of his lab. And it was this. It was the a, a bell with a red line through it. And it said, an award to Professor Carl Leem for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and OK, so I, I finally put two and two together. I was a little bit slow on the uptake. And I was like, wow, you know, he, had a, he had a really good sense of humor. But the, the significance of that little award that someone gave to him as a total joke, which he liked, um, has come back to me many times along the way. Because you get into science for different reasons. And one reason, there are people who decide to go and solve a big problem in science. And in fact, they try to find the problem that is the future Nobel Prize. And let me tell you, in college, and actually still now, the idea that I could possibly tackle that big of a problem in science is almost ridiculous. And uh, that, that, so in some ways, it was almost an encouragement to say, hey, you know, Professor Leem, an incredibly important biologist in my field and beyond, that, you know, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe there's another way of looking at science, a flow of, of curiosity that's just as valid. So I'm going to come back to this, because it came back to haunt me a few years ago to tell you another story about it. But let me tell you about curiosity, and it's where it's gotten me um, in the science, in, in my world of science, in terms of fast movements and evolutionary biology and physics. And it starts with this shrimp. So yes, if you're searching for a Nobel Prize, do you start with the shrimp? Well, as it turns out, well, I'm not searching for a Nobel Prize, but we'll hear a little bit later that actually some Nobel Prizes did start with noticing a peculiar animal doing peculiar things. So this research started about 10 years ago, actually. And I noticed these ridiculous looking mantis shrimp doing things like this. So this is a, um, about a cigar-sized cigar animal. They're found um, in Indonesia, Australia. And it's going to be manipulating this, this little snail, getting it into place. Oh, sorry, didn't like it. Wiggles it around some more, touches it with its nose, and smashes it. OK. Yes, it's ridiculous, right? Uh, I'm watching a, snail, a, a, a mantis shrimp smash open a snail, but my wheels got turning, and I'm like, but wait a minute, that snail? I have to use a big hammer in air to break this thing. How can this little ridiculous shrimp break a snail in water with a little hammer? So first question is, well, can we slow down the movement? Can we see anything else going on? Just for straight up curiosity. What's going on here? So this is filmed at 30,000 frames per second. So your home video might film at 60, maybe 120 frames. So this is slowing down things a lot, play back at about 30. We're holding this band to shrimp, a snail, with a pair of forceps. And boom, look at that, that snail basically fracture into lots of pieces. So what we can do with this video is find out how fast they're going. Some other things are going on in this video as well. Um, so we started to think about, well, how fast do you have to go to create an impact to break a snail? But they also do other ridiculous things. This is filmed at 5,000 frames per second. And here's a mantis shrimp dismembering a very hardy crab. So this is super slowed down. 
um, gets, it all lined, gets stuff all lined up, and smashes the heck out of it and knocks the crab's leg off. So this is a powerful movement, a super high impact, right? Ridiculous. So I decided, what the heck? Let's just find out how fast they're moving. So it turns out that they're moving, they're doing these movements in less than two milliseconds. So if you lined up all the movements in a row, about 150 of them would fit in an eye blink. Obviously, they don't do them that fat in, in that sequence. They're going up to um, 30 meters per second, 68 miles per hour. And they're accelerating up to 10 to the fifth meters per second squared, which is 10 to the four Gs, which is on the same order of magnitude as a bullet in the muzzle of a gun. When we discovered this, this is one of the fastest movements ever described on the planet. So, okay, that's cool, right? <laughs> that's so fun. You know, that's flow. That's yourself <laughs> climbing a mountain and getting like stuck halfway and just realizing, oh my gosh, I just discovered one of the fastest movements on the planet. That's so neat. But it also raises a bunch of questions like why in the world are they going so fast and how does this help them actually do this movement? and to break open these hard shell processes. So for those of you who have the mechanics bent, let me just tell you super quickly, this is analogous to the other, you know, three years and 30 seconds comment. This is even more than that in five seconds. So the way they do this is they have a big muscle, it contracts, little latches in place, prevents the movement. When they're ready to go, they release the latch. That's not enough. A muscle can't actually achieve these movements on its own. They need to enhance the power. So they have a spring and a linkage mechanism. So they store up elastic energy, and then they release it. And then the, the movement occurs at extremely high speeds. Turns out that engineers through history already have known how this is done. Because if you take an arrow and you throw it with your arm, trust me, you are not going to take down a deer. But if you use that exact same arm muscle and add a spring into it, and add a latch and just lower the, the, the time it takes to do the movement and release it, you can generate extremely high accelerations and get pressure enough to puncture the skin of a deer. So this is exactly what they're doing. They've added a latch and a spring, use a nice big forceful muscle, and then they can release this thing explosively. When we looked across species, turns out that, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, it turns out that mantis shrimp across the ages have been using modifications of this mechanism to move things like hatchets and spears and all kinds of stuff. So it's a wonderful physics-based method for explaining and understanding how they generate these movements. If you're going to move something at 60 miles an hour through the water, no matter what you do, the water is going to cavitate. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second, but you can see it here um, just on these shrimp. So when that mantis shrimp's appendage hits that shell, shell, you can see almost a flash of light. And if we just take a single frame of a mantis shrimp hitting a force sensor, you can see a bubble, this cavitation bubble. Cavitation bubbles have been the bane of engineers' ex existence since the start of fast movements in water, because if you spin a boat propeller really fast, it generates what's called the Bernoulli effect, which means you get an area of very low pressure in regions between fast and, high, uh, fast and slow flow. It creates a vapor bubble, and when that vapor bubble collapses, it emits heat equivalent to the heat at the surface of the sun, light, and sound. It is extremely energetic. People have even looked towards this for fusion, nuclear fusion. So what happens? Well, in a pragmatic sense, it wears away and destroys boat propellers. And the same thing happens with mantis shrimp, but they actually do really well. They'll strike tens of thousands of times, breaking open snail shells. Um, and they can molt their appendage, so they can build a fresh one, but they're able to withstand these forces. <coughs> So this is starting to raise a whole bunch of questions. This, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, I'm talking about sitting in a lab, watching an animal break a snail shell and think, oh, I wonder how fast they're going. Now all of a sudden I'm over here in some really tricky fluid dynamics. And there's, no, there's nothing in science at this point to suggest that, you know, that's gonna explain this to me. I have to figure this out myself. And of course, with people um, working with me. So the first thing I did is I had to, I was like, well, is cavitation important? Does it help them actually break their snail shells when they're working on it? So um, I worked 
really hard to come up with a way to, to develop a force sensor that could work in salt water, which is awfully good at generating batteries and destroying all kinds of things, um, and also able to generate extremely high peak transient forces. So I did this and got these animals to come out and hit the force sensor. And we got the first recordings of forces from these animals. And it turns out, if you just look at the peak of that force curve, so from the, the zero up to the top of it, they're generating peak forces of over 2,500 times their body weight, 300 pounds force. That's really impressive. But th this doesn't answer what is the role of cavitation. So we were able to get um, a video at 100,000 frames per second. These animals have tremendous aim and slow it down and start to resolve the time course and the force of cavitation. So you can see the appendage coming in, um, slowly approaching the force sensor. And what you'll see is the impact of the appendage on the sensor and then a return um, and all these cavitation bubbles forming and collapsing. So this allows us to slow it down enough that we can actually start seeing what these fluid dynamic processes are and go back to the literature and we can actually see the phases of a cavitation bubble next to a wall from the literature. Bubble jet micro formation, a rebound, and then right there at the instant of minimum volume is where you get peak force. So let me show you this. For once in my life, science is always a mess for me, but this actually um, sort of looks like what the literature says it's supposed to look like. So if you look at the video on the top, and use your peripheral vision, what you'll be able to see is force of the impact, followed by, right at the instant of minimum volume, another peak from cavitation. This is a typical force trace. Many times cavitation actually exceeds the impact of the appendage by over two times. So we've got a situation here where these animals are generating very, very high peak forces one after another in rapid succession. So this the, the graph that I'm showing you here is time on the x-axis and force on the y-axis. For a two-appendaged animal, and they like to hit in you know, sequence, you get four rapid force peaks from impact and then cavitation, impact and then cavitation. If we take another snail eater, like a horn shark, horn sharks are adorable sharks that won't bite you, they're just snuffling around looking for snails, and other curious biologists have put force sensors in the mouths of horn sharks to find out what kind of forces that these animals can generate in order to break snail shells. So um, that's the mantis shrimp strike there. So notice that the mantis shrimp is achieving the same peak force, but it's occurring over that teeny tiny little red spot relative to the horn shark's um, force trace. So it's an extremely brief moment compared to the horn shark. Yet, we've got a three kilogram horn shark producing 200 newtons of force, and a mantis shrimp that's 40 grams, less than a stick of butter, much less than a stick of butter, um, producing the same peak force. So here I am, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, and all of a sudden what we have is a new view of forces in biology. We just hadn't ever thought about there being an alternative route into a snail shell, which is basically a rapid sequence, rapid fire sequence of high peak um, forces. And maybe this is what allows a teeny tiny animal like mantis shrimp to be able to do what I need to use a hammer for, taking more of the horn shark approach. All of this, of course, has to be considered in the context of evolution. The amazing thing about these animals is that they originated over 100 million years ago, and there's a fossil record. So we can actually see how their appendages have changed over time. And back when they originated, that little blue uh, drawing there is about what the planet looked like. And when mantis, the, the hammering style mantis shrimp showed up, that's about what the world like. They have been around for a really long time. And a lot of the work in my lab has been to understand, well, if we've got the physics of what's called power amplification, these spring latch systems, how does evolution tinker with it? What can we learn from this? So we're gonna come back to that in a minute. In the meantime, I thought, okay, we have all this diversity of mantis shrimp, and we know there are mantis shrimp that are fishers. They go out, they hide in the burrows, and they reach up and they grab fish. And I'm like, okay, these are going to be even faster. I'm going to break my world record from the smashers with the spears. And I tortured my poor graduate student, Maya DeVries, about this for years on end. And she kept coming back and saying, well, they don't cavitate. They're about 25 milliseconds in terms of duration. They only reach two meters per second, but, but, but Sheila, 
that's really fast by every, every, every other biologist's standard, just because it's slow relative to smashing mantis shrimp. And what we realized over time is actually, you don't have to be fast to catch evasive prey. You don't have to be fast to catch a fish. And what we, we realized is that we had discovered a new zone in biology. All of our thinking had been fast as for, you know, running after something or grabbing a fish or hooking something here and there. And when we looked at the literature, it turns out you really don't have to move much more than two meters per second to catch a fish. But if you want to smash a snail shell and use this alternative route of high peak forces, you actually have to be moving extremely fast to generate the accelerations. It also suggests that there might be a speed limit. If these animals hiding in their burrows are catching fish as they go overhead and they set off small cavitation bombs, it's not going to work very well. They're very, cavitation is extremely loud. They're going to be found out. So fish and all these other animals that are moving fast in the water, as well as submarines that have the same problem, have a speed limit. Because once you get above that speed limit, you start cavitating the water and you are loud. Long-term problem in, it seems like, evolutionary history as well as engineering design. Let's come back to this Nobel Prize. So, okay, as you can tell, I've been feeling, you know, super proud of the discoveries that I've made, and I, got, I had a sabbatical, so I went off to the Radcliffe Institute, which is this multidisciplinary institute with photographers and filmmakers and all these people there, as well as um, a, a really famous lawyer from Nigeria. <laughs> and this is relevant, okay? So I, I had to get up and I had to give a talk like this. And I, I can't actually see all of you particularly well, but this other, the room that I was giving this talk into this community, multidisciplinary community, I could see the audience, I could see all their faces. And I could see that everybody was enjoying it, except for this lawyer from Nigeria. And the lawyer from Nigeria, she is, a, she is incredible, extremely famous woman. She has defended women's rights and made massive impact in her country and in the world in general. And she looked really PO'd and increasingly angry as I talked. And I'm like, wow, I have never made somebody mad about mantis shrimp, you know? <laughs> and it's just getting worse. And she storms out, well, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but she, she leaves, doesn't say anything to me. And she comes up to me a few, year, a few days later. And she says, Sheila, and she's very tall and imposing, and of course a lawyer, so very articulate. She goes, Sheila, your talk made me sick. It was disgusting. It was like cup runneth over, wasting resources to study this just, you know, stuff just because you're curious. And I'm like, holy smokes, she's saying it. She's saying exactly what I believe deep inside. That's why I would never try to go for the Nobel Prize, because I am actually incompetent. All this is really stupid. And, you know, it's pretty rare in life when someone comes up and, like, you know, in a professional setting and just gets you exactly at your weakest point. You know, I mean, I, I don't come from a scientist family, and so I have to justify to them all the time about why what I'm doing is important. In fact, my sister has commented that, that um, scientists are among the most self-absorbed, um, useless individuals. She's a high school science teacher, by the way. Um, so uh, the, the lawyer keeps talking. And she says, um, but I was teaching my seminar today, and I had an epiphany, and I think this is the most important thing that might happen during my year here at the Radcliffe Institute. And what I realized while I was teaching my seminar is that I want what you have for my country. She said, until she saw my talk, she'd been seeing talks all the whole year by a poet who spent the year you know, on a boat writing poetry, didn't make her mad. You know, there are other, you know, <laughs> other people doing all this stuff. And she said that she had never in her experience in Nigeria, she had only known of the Nobel Prize style science, which is solving big human problems. She didn't even know about this other area, which is curiosity, you know, research for basic discoveries in science. And she said, I want what you have for my country. I want people in my country to look at what's around them and to be able to discover the basics of science. So I, I was not exactly feeling better by the time she was telling me she was happier about it because, you know, anyway, it was a rough, rough time. And I spent actually the rest of my fellowship agonizing about why what I do is actually important, even if it is a not a Nobel Prize winning um, level <coughs> science. So let's go back. Super quick wrap up here. All of our major model systems for medical research came from somebody 
taking a glance at an animal and noticing something powerful about them. Fruit flies, a biologist was looking at fruit flies and noticed that there were some interesting changes that could be linked to genes. Um, in terms of just populations flopping around his, his, uh, flapping around his lab. Zebrafish, major system for medical uh, human health, was a biologist noticing that zebrafish are see-through during early development. And it's through actually these phases of early development and being able to see what's going on that um, major developmental understanding increments in human health were discovered. Same thing with mouse. When we look at over 200 million years of engineering experiments, tinkering, um, we can develop new products. So geckos, people will be curious how they stick to the roof of a building, um, stick to the ceiling, run around. One of the most important increments in adhesive systems for um, our own daily life is actually inspired by not just gecko feet, but their evolutionary diversity. We're working on this in the context of cavitation reduction. Um, one of my former students, Suzanne Cox, built NinjaBot, who's, which is our model mantis shrimp. We built it to figure out whether cavitation actually smashes, helps break open snail shells. Um, she was able to um, get this thing to be basically a controlled bullet. When she started, the engineer said it wasn't actually possible, but we used what the mantis shrimp could tell us about design features to do it. It took us nine kilograms of steel to do what a mantis shrimp does in 0.4 grams. So we have a lot to learn about materials and biology. We also discovered that mantis shrimp should be cavitating during forward, ro uh, forward rotation, and they don't. So now we're looking at whether there might be some clues from 200 million years of fast rotations in water for how they actually reduce cavitation ro during rotation, which might help us with propeller design and other fast movements underwater to reduce that. Other scientists have gone and looked at what I um, have described, and they figured out why mantis shrimp don't break their own hammers, and they've actually developed some new materials that are fracture resistant, but can still generate high peak impacts. In my own lab, we've also um, taken cues from mantis shrimp fighting. So they have lethal weapons. They will kill each other with one blow, and, um, but they manage to avoid killing each other by doing ritualized fighting where they hit each other's tailplate. That tailplate, it turns out, it works exactly like the material interactions between a baseball and an ash bat. And it works a lot like a, a, um, a boxing bag or in terms of um, absorbing the energy as opposed to bouncing it right back. And it contains information about body size. So there's some amazing material work there as well as some life lessons in terms of how not to kill each other off with lethal weapons. Okay, final thing coming back to the Nobel Prize, to flow to what is science, to what is important, to what matters for impact in biology in terms of figuring it out, but in terms of how do you make an impact. And I wanna come back to the fact that when we look at our surroundings, we can, that's a tree of life on the left, that's us in the red circle. We are nothing compared to the diversity around us, although of course we're dominating it. And if we look at the world as a whole, our planet is predominantly covered with the ocean, one of the least understood areas of our planet and the most important for mediating global climate change. And these areas are worthy of investigation and curiosity and discovery for the sake of it because you don't know what you're gonna learn from it. So to encourage that, to go out and be excited about it and find the science that you think is exciting and to follow with is perhaps the, the biggest aspect of flow, is finding where your brain connects and you make discoveries regardless of what society is telling you um, to do or what the expectations are. So thank you so much for your attention today and it's just so great to be here.